food. Um, again, I'm Abby Hamilton. I am the interim president and CEO at United Way of Roanoke Valley. I want to thank everybody for coming today to join us. As Connie mentioned, you are United Way's most loyal donors and friends, and you're the pillars of this work, and you've allowed us to accomplish so much over um, the last 95 years here at United Way. Um, I have the pleasure of kicking off this portion of our time together by recognizing first some of our special guests. Uh, first, I um, want to thank Mr. Barry Thompson, our Vinton Town Manager, and the team over here at Vinton for being such wonderful hosts to us, and what a wonderful, beautiful space. Don't you all agree? Thank you. We also have in our midst several of our United Way board members. I want to call them out so they can wave to you and you know um, where they're seated. Paula Brown, Robert Jeffrey, and Diane Speaks. Um, thank you for, for being here. So uh, while you are uh, eating, I, I thought this was something interesting. Connie pointed out that sometime, what, 70 years ago, there would have been a similar lunch party like this that was United Way related. And that would have been in the middle of the 1940s. I'm going to preempt a little bit of what our speaker will say. But as you know, that would have been in the middle of all the rationing, all the post-war stuff. And so a typical menu in the 1940s for a gathering like this, get ready, would have been sweet, sliced, and sour tongue, potato pudding, uh, a vegetable plate of cauliflower, beets, and green beans, some rolls and cookies. Now, we are not obviously having that. We didn't go that far in imitating the 1940s. Um, and that is because we have a generous sponsor. Thank you very much, Allstate Insurance Company, for being our sponsor for today's event. That was a little, little levity for you for today. Um, so while we continue the rest of your food, don't miss out on the dessert. It looks delicious. I'm going to go back to that when I get seated. Um, let me introduce you to our guest speaker, because I know you've been looking forward to hearing from him. Um, Nelson Harris has learned quite a bit about the time in or, our organization's history. Um, he is about to release his 14th book, A History of Roanoke Valley in the 1940s to 1949. And before he tells you about that, um, a little background on him, though I'm really not sure that he does require quite of an introduction. I can see everybody showed up to hear um, from him today. So if you've lived in Roanoke for any time, you probably have met him before, read one of his books, you have probably been taught by him or ministered by him in various roles. Um, maybe you know him, he is a former Roanoke mayor where he served from 2004 to 2008 and from his beloved Heights Community Church where he's been the minister for, for, 40, for 20 years. Um, so he was actually, I did not know this, that you were, you grew up at that church too, which is a wonderful um, way to kind of just be growing up from the ranks. And he graduated from Patrick Henry High School, wonderful local roots, and then uh, went to Radford University. He went on to attend uh, South, Southeastern Baptist Theological Seminary with a postgraduate work at Princeton Theological Seminary and Harvard University, quite impressive. Um, today, he's going to talk about his upcoming 14th book, as I mentioned, History of the Rank Valley from 1940 to 1949. And in reading about every single issue of the Roanoke Times in that decade from our archives, i.e. the filing cabinet, um, he learned quite about those early days of United Way. So Nelson Harris, thank you for keeping our history and we look forward to the sneak peek of your upcoming book. Thank you so much. Well, that was a very generous introduction and I, I appreciate that. And Thank you for having me, and, and thank you for your participation and your loyalty to United Way and uh, for what your dollars and the dollars of your organizations or companies do to make life uh, richer and better for uh, so many uh, of us uh, here in the Roanoke Valley. And as has been mentioned, uh, I'm going to uh, take a, an opportunity to share with you today 
some of the outcomes and some of the achievements that the what was called the community fund in the 1940s uh, accomplished. And when Jesse and Connie came and approached me about being the speaker today, uh, that was something we immediately gravitated uh, to. And so uh, I've kind of entitled uh, my presentation, uh, Vintage Values, uh, A Legacy of Progress. And as has been mentioned, uh, this work comes from an, an upcoming book, it's not out yet, but at least I know what the cover is going to look like, uh, the Roanoke Valley in the 1940s. And I also put up uh, the logo of the Roanoke Public Library Foundation because I, I want to credit them. They were the ones that funded my research and, uh, and the book that will come out. And so I just always like to acknowledge them and their partnership with me because what I'm about to, to share with you uh, is a result of their support and their, their encouragement. So anyway, but the book will be out in uh, March of, of, next, of next year. I want to begin with this photograph. This is the Heller Kindergarten at the uh, Hunton uh, YMCA. The community fund uh, in the 1940s was significant in funding, uh, along with other organizations, kindergartens. And of course, uh, you and I know today that, that kindergarten is pretty much now a part of public education and public school systems, but back in the 40s, it was not. I love this image. It's very timely. It's very seasonal right now because obviously we've got uh, the kindergarten children doing something around Thanksgiving. They've got little construction pilgrim hats on and, and all of that kind of thing. And so this is the, the kindergarten, again, that was at the Hunton YMCA, something that the community fund was a part of. I show this photograph to contrast it with this photograph. This photograph was how children were treated in our city about 25 years prior to the photograph you just looked at. This is the workforce of the cotton mill in Norwich uh, in the 1910s. What a difference. What a difference. And so when you look at this photograph, and I've always been, my eyes always been drawn to the little boy that's kind of in the bottom center of that photograph because there's another boy behind him with his arms wrapped around him. I'm going to kind of assume they were probably brothers. And anyway, these children worked in the Norwich cotton mill six days a week for 10 cents a day for 12 hour days. So when you look at that photograph, and compare it to that photograph, thank you, community fund, that we took a very different perspective and made giant leaps forward in saying as a community that uh, children needed to be prepared to enter school, that children's most valuable uh, uh, asset that they could have was not 10 cents a day, but was an education. And so I want to kind of begin there because that says so much about kind of the community fund. And there's just another view of uh, the child laborers at Norwich. You can see the, the young girl there on the right at a, at a cotton spool. Let me move to another vignette of a direct result of the community fund back in the, in the 1940s. This is Burl Memorial Hospital. Uh, in the 40s. And I don't know how many of you all are familiar with the history of Burl Hospital. It is a fascinating history of an African-American hospital here in our city back sadly in the day when medical care was segregated. Uh, Burl Memorial Hospital was the most highly accredited, longest lasting African-American hospital in the Appalachian region, not just in Roanoke, not just in the Roanoke Valley, but in a, in a broad geographical area. In fact, it served a 17-county area. Burrell Memorial Hospital was named after Dr. Isaac Burrell, who was a physician in Roanoke. In 1914, he needed gallbladder surgery, and at that time, uh, local hospitals in Roanoke did not 
uh, serve African-American patients. And so he had to take a train. He was put in a, literally, a freight train uh, and taken to the Freedmen's Hospital in Washington, D.C. Uh, because he did not arrive in time, he died en route. And so five African-American physicians in our city the following year in 1915 started Burrow Memorial Hospital. This hospital facility was actually the Allegheny Institute, which was a uh, boys preparatory school that went out of business. The city of Roanoke bought it, leased it to uh, Burrow Memorial Hospital Association for a dollar a year so that the African American community and the African American physicians in Roanoke could actually have a bona fide hospital. Burrow Memorial Hospital at the end of the 40s had vastly outgrown its facility. And so there came a need for a new hospital. The community fund stepped up to the plate and, uh, and spearheaded the effort to uh, create a new Burrow Memorial Hospital. So this was Burrow Memorial Hospital in 1948, 1949. This was Burrow Memorial Hospital in the mid-1950s. Thank you, Community Fund. Not only was Burrow Memorial Hospital a part of the Community Fund's emphasis in the 1940s, but we also had uh, Roanoke Hospital. Now, this photo dates from about the 1920s, but it would still kind of look the same in the mid-40s, they too were experiencing the same needs to grow and to expand and to uh, offer uh, better and uh, more varied medical services. And so the leaders of the community fund in the late 40s paired the drive to raise money for Roanoke Hospital with Burl Memorial Hospital. Prior to that, any fundraising efforts for the hospitals were always separated by the African American community took care of Burl, the white community took care of Roanoke Hospital, the community fund said we're not going to do it that way anymore, we're going to have a fund drive that's a part of us for both hospitals where everybody com uh, uh, contributes to the same bucket, so to speak. And so these two hospital drives went forward, united as one consolidated community effort. Thank you, community fund. And so that was what Roanoke Hospital looked like basically at the end of the 1940s. Here's what it looked like in the mid-1950s. Thank you, community fund. And so when you're thinking about vintage values and you really think about the legacy that the United Way has in the Roanoke Valley, a lot of these things kind of get, get lost, right? Because the 1940s was, uh, was several decades ago. And we forget, as a community, the critical role, uh, the progressive role that United Way slash Community Chess slash Community Fund uh, has contributed over the decades to improving the quality of life here in the Roanoke Valley. And uh, so we started with, with children, kindergarten, thank you community fund. Two hospitals have now tremendously expanded as a result of the community fund in the late 1940s. And then we have the Hunt and Life Saving and First Aid crew. Thank you community fund. Uh, the Hunt and Life Saving and First Aid crew uh, came about uh, was actually organized two weeks after Pearl Harbor. And again, because sadly we lived in an era at that time of, of segregation, the African American community had no life-saving crew. And so uh, Julian Wise, who I'm going to show here in just a moment, worked across this state tirelessly to create and establish uh, volunteer, what we call today volunteer rescue squads. And so the Hunt and Life Saving and First Aid crew is a result of Julian Wise's effort to kind of spearhead the, that organization, but 
they needed a, an ambulance. They needed equipment for that ambulance. Uh, infantile paralysis, what we now call polio. Uh, they needed an iron lung. Thank you, community fund. And so here's the hunt and life-saving and first aid crew, the original crew uh, in, the, in the 1940s. Here's Julian Wise and the Roanoke life-saving crew back in the 1920s, and so we just kind of tip our hats to them. Now here's the amazing thing, here's the fascinating thing about the Roanoke life-saving crew and the Hunton life-saving crew. The Roanoke life-saving crew was the first all-volunteer rescue squad in the United States. Established in 1928. So the Roanoke Valley can claim as a part of our kind of historic legacy the very first volunteer rescue squad in the United States. When Julian Wise died uh, back a couple decades ago, because of his effort to pioneer the volunteer rescue squad, there were literally tens of thousands of communities nationwide that now had volunteer rescue squads. That is all back in Roanoke as its beginning. The Hunton life-saving and first aid crew that you saw just a minute ago was the first all African American volunteer rescue squad, guess what, in the United States. And so Again, thank you, when it comes to the hunting crew, thank you, Community Fund. I mean, that's a part of your legacy, that you helped create that crew and contributed to this movement that, again, got birthed in Roanoke. Also want to take a moment and share uh, uh, some things that give a little broader context to these vintage values uh, that were spearheaded and upheld by the Community Fund and the United Way. And so I want to digress for just a moment and talk about a couple of other things that came out of my research during the 1940s that I think will give us a greater appreciation for the kind of progressive ideals and values that uh, the Community Fund uh, had. In 1941, Sarah Craig got on a city bus and <clears throat> she sat in the middle of that bus and two young uh, white uh, gentlemen got on the bus at the next stop and the bus driver asked Miss Craig to move to the back of the bus. Now this is a decade and a half before Rosa Parks. Sarah Craig reluctantly got up and moved to the back of the bus and she became the first person, and I'm gonna kinda finish this story, who refused to move to the back of the bus. The boys got off on a stop or two later. She moved back to the seat that she had possessed originally. Another stop and a, a white rider got on the bus and at this point she refused to move to the back of the bus. And so she was uh, fined uh, or brought to, to court uh, to have a fine imposed. And Judge Harris Birchfield heard the case. And Harris Birchfield did something that no other judge up to this point had ever done in the Commonwealth of Virginia. And that is that he didn't have the power to overturn the city ordinance that uh, governed where riders were to sit on a city bus. Uh, but he brought in all the African-American attorneys in the city to discuss with them the case of Sarah Craig. Uh, again, she was in violation of the city ordinance, and on the way of getting off the bus, she slapped the bus driver. So the bus driver had, had sued Miss Craig for assault. So he had both of these matters before him. And uh, after having a discussion with the African-American attorneys and uh, with the city attorney, he ultimately dismissed the case. Well, kudos to Judge Harris Birchfield uh, for thinking progressively, uh, at least from a legal perspective. 
But I offer that just simply by way of context to give us a sense of the times in which folks lived in the 1940s. Thus, when the community fund says, you know what, we're going to make sure that all children, not just white children, but all children, are going to have access to kindergarten and be ready for school, i.e. the Heller Kindergarten at the Hunton YMCA. That's progressive. That's a vintage value that we, we possess today. And when the community fund said in the context of, of the situation that Sarah Craig was finding herself in saying, you know what, we're not going to have any more a fund drive just for the white hospital, but we're going to pair into the community fund and community chest monies for Borough Memorial Hospital. We're going to go forward with medical care for all together. That's a, a vintage value that for that time and for that day was quite progressive. 1945, it's a great story and I won't tell every detail of it, but we have a guy by the name of S.J. Phillips. The birthplace of the Booker T. Washington uh, came up for sale. And of course, this is over in, in Franklin County. And S.J. Phillips was a, an African-American attorney that was down in Alabama, and he wanted to buy the Booker T. Washington birthplace to create it for what you and I know it to be today, to be a memorial, to be a, a, a park, to be a place that, uh, that Booker T. Washington could, could be honored. Well, it was going to come up for auction, and so the, the auction was quickly approaching, and, and S.J. Phillips realized that, you know, if he came from Alabama and showed up at an auction in Franklin County as an African-American attorney, would his bid be received? I hate to say it, but that was in the back of his mind. So here's a fascinating story. He goes to the president of Nehi Bottling Company tells the president of Nehi Bottling Company what he wants to do. And the president of Nehi Bottling Company says, well, here's what we'll do. We'll, we'll send a guy from, from my office over to the auction with you, and we will act as if Nehi Bottling Company is buying the Booker T. Washington birthplace. He said, you bid on it. It's going to be your money, but we're going to act like Nehi Bottling is in on this. And so S.J. Phillips does. He goes over there. He's the, he's the winning bid. And as the clip says, for $7,610. Well, the auctioneer uh, over outside of Rocky Mount uh, really didn't quite understand why Nehi Bottling Company would have any interest in the Booker T. Washington uh, birthplace. And so an hour went by until he could get the president of the bottling company on the phone and confirm that indeed there was interest by the bottling company in the, in the Booker T. Washington birthplace. He confirmed that, oh yes, he was keenly interested uh, in the purchase of the birthplace. And so the auction went through. S.J. Phillips got back down to Alabama, and the president of the Nehi Bottling Company said, you know, it really wasn't us. It was S.J. Phillips. Um, all, is, all is good. And so that's how the Booker T. Washington Birthplace Monument Park got its start. I just say that to say this. What creative collaboration that was, uh, to think that S.J. Phillips from Alabama and the president of Nehi Bottling would, would kind of collaborate to make this happen. And I, I want to just, just say to you that as a vintage value, you know, one of the things that we ought to always value, particularly as partner organizations within the large umbrella of United Way, is when people collaborate creatively, sometimes out of just raw necessity, good things can happen. And again, that gives just a little bit of, of context to how progressive some of the things that the community fund was doing uh, were uh, at the 40s. But it's a great story, and there's more to it than, than that. But in 1946, we also had the uh, integration of the Roanoke City uh, Police Department. And I want to share with you, because you're going to, going to think, well, how is this related, related to United Way? How is this related to Community Fund? In my research, the leaders of the Community Fund 
made things happen in the Roanoke Valley that really were a little bit beyond just, just the, the kind of the boundaries of the community fund. And the leaders of the community fund were the ones who went and parked themselves in the office of the city manager and the city police chief and said, it is not right that we have a police force that does not have African American officers. And we need to integrate the police force. Now understand this was before any kind of, of integration of anything was really occurring uh, in, the, in the Commonwealth of Virginia. But to read those newspaper articles and see the names of those who were part and heading up the community fund drives, they were the movers and shakers that went in and said this is what we need to do as a city. This is what we need to do as a community. This is the right thing to do. And so again, I just want to say that community fund at an individual level, at a leadership level, made what you see on the screen happen back in 1946. Thank you, community fund. In 1947, uh, a lot of folks don't know this. I did not know this until I was doing my research, but in 1947, Thurgood Marshall, who was uh, an attorney at that time out of New York, uh, came to Roanoke, Virginia. And it was on the eve of the 12th annual convention of the NAACP. And he stood in the vestibule of uh, Ebenezer AME Church here in Roanoke. And he said, and he announced for the very first time, he said uh, that the NAACP was going to legally challenge uh, segregation in Virginia, county by county, until it was eliminated. And he also announced, I am filing tomorrow to integrate the University of Virginia. That happened in Roanoke. That happened in Roanoke. And again, I would just suggest to you that this, this vintage value of opportunity of equality, of being in this larger context of the leadership of the community fund, the Harris Birch Fields of the day, uh, I think was one of the contributing factors that Thurgood Marshall thought that moment in Roanoke was the place and the time to roll out that plan. And another thing that I, I want to share with you from the, the 1940s, again, digress here a little bit. You know, we had the first volunteer rescue squad in the United States. We had the first volunteer African-American rescue squad in the United States. Did you all know that the first African-American ambassador in the history of the United States was born and raised in Roanoke? Edward Dudley. Uh, grew up at 405 Gilmer Avenue. He went to Harrison School. He uh, went to uh, Addison. And uh, in 1948, President Harry Truman appointed him uh, emissary uh, to Liberia. And here's the newspaper article. It was in the Roanoke Times uh, at that time. And so he goes, and he is the U.S. Uh, envoy, emissary to, to that uh, particular country. While he was serving in that capacity, uh, the diplomatic relations between the United States and Liberia went up a notch. And so when it went to a more elevated status, it went from the U.S. having a consulate there to the U.S. having an embassy there. And so when that happens, you don't have an emissary or an envoy, you now have an ambassador. So Edward Dudley was there in Liberia, and he then rose to the rank of ambassador. Harry Truman was heavily pressured to remove Dudley from the position. Now here's something else. One of the guys who went and sat Truman down, and Truman was very progressive, by the way, particularly in his civil rights. One of the guys that went and sat Truman down and said, this is the right thing, leave Dudley where he is, let him move to the rank of ambassador, was the soon-to-be-named U.S. Secretary of Defense, Lewis Johnson. Guess where Lewis Johnson grew up? 
in Boston, Massachusetts. No, no, he grew up in Roanoke, Virginia. He grew up in Roanoke, Virginia. And so here, this is just amazing. Here in the Oval Office is Lewis Johnson from Roanoke, soon to be U.S. Secretary of Defense, talking to Truman about leaving Dudley, who grew up in Roanoke, Virginia, as the emissary, let him rise to the rank of ambassador. It was an easy decision for Truman, and he left Dudley where he was. And so Roanoke has claim to the first African-American ambassador ever in the history of the United States. I just wanted to throw that in. Connie, it doesn't have a whole lot to do with community fun, but it's a great story. It's a great story. We all like those things. Let me end a little bit on, on this note. Here's the old Academy of Music, and uh, the Academy of Music used to be on Salem Avenue and is, is, is long, since, uh, long since gone, was torn down in the, in the 50s. But I want to I wanna kind of conclude here because I want to, we've talked about uh, children, we've talked about medical care, we've talked about emergency medical care, we've talked about progressive values in terms of, of, uh, of, of, of integrating uh, our fund drives and, and our collaborations and that kind of thing, all thank you community fund. Let me end on the arts. Let me end on, on the arts. You know, a part of, of what so many of you do uh, that are partner organizations with the United Way is, uh, you know, is with, with culture and, and with the arts and with, with human services that the arts contribute to. And so anyway, here we have the Academy of Music. The Academy of Music fell on hard times uh, in the late 1940s. And so uh, it became held by a nonprofit organization. And guess who the leadership uh, for that effort, uh, guess where that leadership came from? You know, if you don't answer my questions, I, I, we're just going to have dead silence here for just a moment. Where did the leadership come from? Community fund. Community fund. The, the leadership of the community fund went to uh, uh, the city and said, we want to take possession of the Academy of Music. It was the premier uh, performance venue in the Roanoke Valley at, at that time. And, uh, and so they did. And it allowed the arts to continue uh, to flourish uh, here in the Roanoke Valley uh, after, uh, after World War II. And that's just a, a couple shots of the Academy of Music as it existed in the, in the late 40s. Here are all the, the various art organizations that were operating uh, in the Roanoke area by the late 1940s. We had a, we had a light opera company, uh, a civic theater, a symphony, a chorus. The Academy Players was a, a, a theater group that performed uh, at, the, at the Academy. Uh, we had a ballet. We had patchwork players. This is a cool group. The patchwork players were all college students. And they come in from college, and they would do dramas and comedies in city parks. I mean, this is, this is really fun. They would, I mean, sometimes it was Shakespeare, sometimes it was something else, but they would literally go around in the summertime and do, and do productions in city parks all across the city. Guess who funded them? Community fund. Community fund. Thank you, community fund. Salem Ensemble. We had a children's theater at Thursday Morning Music Club. Had the Community Concert Association, and this is kind of where I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end. The Community Concert Association was exactly what the name implied. It was a group that was dedicated to bringing the very best performing arts to the Roanoke Valley uh, in the night, late 1940s and, and on, into, on into the 50s. Every major symphony orchestra came uh, to Roanoke in the late 1940s, courtesy of the Community Concert Association. Guess who was their major funder? Community Fund. Thank you, Community Fund. And so uh, we had the National Symphony Orchestra. We had the orchestras from San Francisco and from Detroit and from Chicago and from Philadelphia and from Atlanta that came through. We had stars from the Metropolitan Opera that came through on a regular basis due to the Community Concert Association funded by the Community Fund. Uh, we had the original cast of Porgy and Bess come and perform for a week at the Academy of Music. Thank you, 
community fund via the Community Concert Association. So I'm going to close with my favorite story of the Community Concert Association. And that was this. I'm, not, I'm going to get to the slide in just a moment because I don't want to give it away. The Academy of Music had been closed temporarily by the city fire marshal. Well, the Community Concert Association, funded by who? The Community Fund, had already booked a major orchestra to come and perform, and of course thinking that the venue would be the Academy of Music. It's now closed. So where do they, where do they go? Because they wanted them to still come here. Well, they ended up performing in the auditorium of Jefferson High School. So, okay. Now, there was a very young up-and-coming conductor uh, that was with this orchestra. Anybody recognize that guy? Leonard Bernstein. Leonard Bernstein came and conducted the Pittsburgh Symphony in the auditorium of Jefferson High School. He was 27 years old. The Roanoke Times reviewer wrote that his movements were so, I, for, I forget what his word was, but it said, as if he was playing every instrument in the orchestra. So he had tremendous vibe and tremendous energy. But now when I drive by the Jeff Center, I cannot help but think, as a result of my little research and running through the reels and reels and reels of the Roanoke Times, that, you know what? <laughs> Leonard Bernstein was 27 years old and, and got a symphony orchestra onto the stage and gave, uh, and gave a concert. I say that to say this. That was the quality of arts and performances and artists and conductors that were coming to this city, to this place, as a result of the community fund and the value that the community fund leadership and donors placed upon kindergarten, medical care, emergency medical care. We're not doing black, white anymore. The arts. And so this is fascinating, fascinating stuff. I, I could literally go on much longer and you would very much be like my congregation saying to yourself, thank goodness he's not. <laughs> but I just, you know, I just want to say to you, as, as you are, again, contributors, partners to, to the United Way, this, this effort, this program of community chest and community fund and, and United Way, almost a century now in this city, has done and will continue to do just amazing things and will make things happen that will have direct and indirect benefits upon everybody who lives here. And so I just, I just wanted to come and I appreciate the invitation and just say to you, you are the bearer, the stewards of tremendously cherished vintage values that have left for almost a century a legacy of progress in this city and in this valley of which you should feel very proud and very good. So thank you for having me today. Thank you for what you do. Thank you, United Way. Wow, my, my, United, my United Way and Roanoke history IQ points just went up 50 points just from, from listening to you. Uh, join me again with, for another round of applause. Reverend Harris, that was amazing. If you thought he was a really good speaker, he has his books available right outside this room for, for the author to sign too and purchase from him so that you can enjoy more stories about Roanoke and other things going on. Um, I've been listening to the stories that uh, Reverend Harris shared with us and I'm kind of reflecting back on our 95 year history here in the Roanoke Valley. 
you can't do any better than, than what you've shared to truly have an appreciation of what it means to be United Way. And United Way isn't the, just the institution, right? United Way is all of us here in this room and all of us are outside this room that get to be part of the vision that we're creating for this community. And it kind of made me think about three things that kind of have stood the test of time that are the same things so many years ago that are still true today. One is that a lot of the institutions that we now enjoy are, have stood the test of time. Carillion, the Burl Center, all of the arts that we get to enjoy are all part of investments that United Way made in this community. And these are the things that have become part of the fabric of this community. It's from that tradition of giving, it's the tradition of results, it's tradition of accountability, it is the tradition of caring for community that is still true today. And then I think about the types of creative collaboration that happened during that time. What, I, what, I love that story. I'm going to bring it up next time we have a collaborative meeting with partners to say that, you know, if they can figure out a solution back then, I'm pretty sure we can figure out something right now. And I think about the story of the classroom, the one classroom that we were able to impact back then as the community fund. Can you imagine that today that work actually translates to over 7,000 young children working with 1,500 teachers across the region. That's what your United Way dollars and what your United Way investments get to do. So it's not just one classroom now, but across the region, you get to make an impact and you get to create the kind of future that we want for this community because of that. And finally, I think I probably was most inspired about United Way taking a stand on all of those daunting tasks around integration, around segregation around the things that where we said that's not going to be okay anymore and these are the things that are no longer acceptable to us because if they're not good enough for me they're not going to be good enough for somebody else and that love for equality and love for this community is what will carry us on as united way into the future and into the next 95 years. And so I'm incredibly, incredibly moved by these wonderful stories and I apologize for crying <laughs> because it truly gives us an appreciation of where we have been in the past. And it's also an inspiration for all of us to say, I'm pretty sure back then it wasn't easy it wasn't easy during the 1940s to scrape by and give what you could, but people did it anyway. It wasn't easy to stand up to inequality and face and challenge ourselves to do something about inequity in this community, but people did it anyway. Why? Because we care about the communities that we live in, we play in, we work in, and the, this is the community that we want to raise our families. And so I want to challenge you as you leave today to be thinking about what United Way means to you this year and in the next 95 years that we're going to be partnering together. We have so much wonderful work in store for us in the community and so many people that continue to depend on us. It's not outdated at all. As he said, it's like vintage values we are still as relevant then as we are today. And I wanna thank you for shepherding us all these 95 years and being part of this celebration. You are the pillars of United Way. Thank you for carrying us on your backs and inspiring the future generation to do the same. Thank you very much. I wanna make sure that I point out the staff who have worked so hard to put this event together. I would be so remiss if I didn't mention them um, today. Jesse Kaufman, where are you? Thank you, and, and Connie Stevens for imagining what this event could look like, and for the rest of our United Way team who are joining you at each of the tables, thank you um, for your service. And as, as donors, partners, friends in the community, let's continue to lift 10,000 families to self-sufficiency. We've got work to do. 
and let's make it happen. Thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of your day.